Hey guys, this is Tommy from the Ravens Creek Studio, from the Ravens Creek Study. Uh, got both. Um, this is a look at replacement theology and why it is that I personally am not a replacement theologian. Um, we've kind of gone through a little basis of what the Bible's talking about when it says Israel. That was in the last video. This video, excuse me, this video I want to establish a pattern that I've noticed in regard to Sodom, Israel, and Judah. And I think the replacement theologian falls into the, the fourth category there. Um, so Ezekiel 16 discusses the sins of Sodom and the northern Israel, comparing Judah's sin with, the, with them both. Uh, Judah saw the sin of Sodom and the sin of Israel, and that judgment came upon Sodom and came upon Israel. Yet Judah, even though he see they even though Judah has seen both of these people's sins and the judgment that came to them, not only continues to sin, but does worse than them, and expects nothing's going to happen to them. Ezekiel maintains that Judah beheld the things that came upon Sodom and Israel, and yet performed more sins and worse sins than both of them combined. God's question through the prophet is this, how can you watch me judge those people and then perform the same kind of wickedness and not think that I'm going to judge you? You can see this in Ezra, Ezra's mentality. In Ezra 4, 1 through 5, we read of adversaries that came to the people and, and they say that they have worshipped the Lord since they were taken away into Assyria. Now, who is it? that was taken away into Syria, who could that possibly be? The only people that they are that they could be would be the northern Israelites who were taken away into the Assyrian captivity. And they're coming back and they're saying, hey, we've worshipped the Lord since we were taken away. Now, I understand that it says they're adversaries, they're enemies, but that does not then justify that without even consulting the Lord, Ezra just says, you have no part with us in building a temple to our God. Here's my problem. Here's my personal problem with that. The difficulty that I find, the difficulty is that I find nowhere in the previous commands of God that this should have been the attitude. First, there's no mention that Ezra prayed to seek the Lord's counsel. Second, they did not say, if you do these things, then you can join us in repairing the wall, but the repairing of the temple must be done by us. He would have known right then and there by offering that one as to whether they were adversaries or whether they were actually legitimately trying to help. Third, God has always accepted the foreigner and sojourner. And once again, I understand they're called enemies, but that doesn't mean that the proper reaction was taken. We can see how many people, we can see this in, in the body of Christ now, how many people do you know of? that have that kind of mentality because they're not Baptist or because they're not King, King James only or because they're not charismatic or they're not Catholic or they're not Protestant or whatever distinguishing mark they have that they think this is the Christian faith. Anyone outside and separated from it are considered less than and they will have no part with us. That mentality does not stem from a jealousy for the glory of God nor from a love of the truth. It is utterly arrogant elitism. Utterly. Ezra 9 and 10, another, another segment that I have a problem with. You have in Ezra 9 and 10, Ezra weeping because of the intermarriage between the Judah and, and the Babylonians, and he says, you better go divorce your wives. I mean, this man is weeping and coercing people to divorce their spouses. I mean, where does he find that in the Old Testament? Where does he find that in the previous commands of God? I mean, come on. Even King David had Rahab and Ruth in his lineage, which also means the Messiah has Rahab and Ruth in their lineage. I mean, and, and you know what? That's even saying let's rebuke Boaz and David for even marrying these people because... Because Bathsheba was born of a Hittite. So may the Lord rebuke Boaz and David for taking these, these 
sinners in. I mean, does that sound like the heart of God? Does that sound like the way God views the Gentiles who come to him? What happened to Ruth declaring, my people shall be your, your people shall be my people, your God shall be my God? What happened to Ruth saying, I'm severing myself from the ties of my ancestors and I'm coming to be with you, Naomi? What happened to that? Instead, Ezra just seems to think these people aren't, they're not Israelite, they're not pure, so we're just going to go ahead and force them away. It's completely an elitist mentality. Replacement theology then does the same thing. That kind of mentality is the root of replacement theology. The people so desperately want to be Israel that they repeat the very sins and arrogance of Israel. Judah saw the Samaritans from northern Israel as less than under and rejected. And yet Christians repeat that same disposition by calling Israel rejected less than and accursed. Even after the atrocities of church history, we still don't relent. I can't help but wonder if part of the reason we have so much corruption, so much denominationalism, so much carnality at work in our ministries and churches comes down to the fact that we wanted to be Israel and so God let us have our heart's desire. We so badly wanted to replace Israel that God's like, fine, I'll give you their curses as well. You want their blessings? I'll give you both. We have so coveted their promises and covenants that we got their curses in bondage too. There's a pattern here. It's a pattern in Scripture for they who claim themselves to be the only people of God. Just when they have lifted themselves above the others, judgment comes and destroys everything. What are we doing that's different than Judah's pride? Where has the cycle been broken? What are we doing differently? What, where have we repented? Is it truly enough to say that because we are in Christ and they weren't, that there's no longer any worry? Does that actually stand to reason? Does it truly does it truly stand to reason that the new covenant means there is no more judgment? I mean, is that what the New Testament says? If so, if you think so, you should go read what Jesus said to the Laodiceans in Revelation 3. I chastise whom I love. I rebuke those whom I love. He chastises them, judges them, because he loves them, even under the new covenant. Now, of course, this is not a, refu a refutation of the position. It's not like this is saying that replacement theology has to be wrong because look at these other people who have had the same heart. Uh, we still need to go through the points of replacement theology and explain the, in the inconsistencies. We still need to establish the proper view. Now, mind you, I'm not a Zionist. I'm not. So I'm not interested in saying that we need to support Israel and send the Jew to that safe haven. Uh, what I contend for is that salvation is of the Jews, just as Jesus told the woman at the well, and that the mission of Jesus was under the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and that God's larger mission unto the Gentiles is only second to the primary mission unto Israel. What I contend for is that it is through Israel that the, the rest of the nations come. Is it God's prerogative to choose whom he shall choose, or is it unfair that God has opportunity to choose? Once again, this gets at the heart of the matter. Who's the one who gets to choose? If God should declare that Israel is his people, then would our scoff and claims of unfairness make that declaration null and void? If God were to truly desire that Israel be the people through whom blessing shall come to all nations, is that such an insult that we should vent with frustration in the manner that we do? Uh, the point here is to expose the heart. What kind of root of anti-Semitism is there in your heart? Is there any? Are you not? I hope not. The litmus test is found here in these questions. If, you're the if in your theology, God cannot choose that people and keep that people as his people, regardless of their disobedience and hard hearts, then your theology of replacement is based upon arrogance, hatred, and ignorance. When speaking of national Israel as the people of God, what is not meant is that they have a salvation outside of Christ Jesus in faith. 
Instead, what is meant is that God has an eternal promise toward them. When he chose them, he chose them. They are the elect nation and therefore are ever and always the people of God, regardless of whether they're obedient or not. This isn't about salvation outside of the outside of faith in Jesus Christ, but rather the expectant hope of one day all Israel shall indeed be saved. Election is not determined by salvation in Christ, but upon covenant. Romans 11 does indeed say that they have been cast off, but the conclusion is that all Israel shall be saved. If that doesn't mean all Israel, then it doesn't mean anything. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot divorce the term Israel in Romans 11.26 with the Israel of Romans 11.25. If the blindness has come upon the natural Israel in Romans 11.25, then it must be that the natural Israel will be saved in Romans 11.26. So with that, I'm going to conclude. That's going to be, that's my foundation. <laughs> now we're going to enter into the, the various arguments that have been set up for uh, replacement theology. I'm going to tear them down one by one. Uh, so, look forward to that. Uh, thanks for listening. I'll, I'll see you next time. Grace to you in Christ.